From We First and Goal 17 Media, welcome to Lead with We. I'm Simon Mannering, and today I'm joined by Seth Goldman, the co-founder and chief change agent of Eat the Change. Now, Eat the Change is a fresh approach to food from an activist entrepreneur and celebrity chef, focusing on sustainable and plant-based ingredients to empower us to quite literally eat the change you wish to see in the world. Now, along with Eat the Change, Seth is also the co-founder of the fast casual restaurant Plant Burger and chair of Beyond Meat. And we'll discuss how to start and scale a purposeful and disruptive business that literally builds a new and impactful category. And how to educate, engage and inspire all stakeholders and especially consumers to accelerate your business growth. So Seth, welcome to Lead With We. Thank you, Simon. It's great to be with you. Now, you know, if I look at your history, I see that you've leveraged partnerships time and again to launch these really disruptive companies. And, you know, in the context of Lead With We, why is your mindset that way? Why did you always approach it in terms of having a partner? Well, you know, this work is challenging. Um, You're going up against very strong forces with tons of inertia. And so uh, I I was a marathon runner, so I'd like to think I have endurance. But even so, it's great to feel like you've got somebody in, in the trenches with you, you know, to use a, a wartime metaphor, but, you know, to feel like you, who you're aligned with and who you can really uh, know has got your back and has, can bring an idea and insight from a different perspective. So uh, all the businesses I've been in, um, I've enjoyed them all. And I've never been one to worry about, oh, I, I, I don't want to spread the prize out. I'm, I, I want to get to the, I want to get to the prize and, and I want to get there with as many people as I can helping me. And, you know, you and I have known each other for a while, but I discovered in my research that you actually have a background in politics. Yeah. So yeah, that was a government you know, major in college. Yeah. So why did you start at that end of sort of this trajectory? Yeah, because I've always thought of myself as an activist more than a, a business person. And so I, I, when I was in high school and college, the, the folks who were making change happen that I saw were politicians. And, uh, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts. I actually um, worked for Mike Dukakis, who in 1988 ran for president, but he was, a, he was a, you know, he inspired me as a governor. And so that was kind of the, the kind of leader I saw, the leadership I saw that was focused on change. And uh, I ended up working on Dukakis's presidential campaign. And then I ended up working for Lloyd Benson, who was his running mate for two and a half years. And I really admired that work, but it felt a little too far removed from the kind of impact I wanted to see. Yeah. And so, um, and now, of course, as I've been in business for several decades, I've seen that the business arena, not every business arena, but the one I've chosen to be in, can be a, a, an arena where tons of change can happen. And, and really, you can be an activist, a really um, aggressive activist, meaning go, by aggressive, I mean really digging into the issues that, that I care about, uh, and in a way, doing it in a way that's less political. I, I feel like what we're doing appeals or can appeal to people across all different political beliefs, uh, and, and the impact we can have can be direct and much less compromise-filled than the business world. So uh, I'd like to think I've kept the activist hat on. I've just changed the venue where I practice it. I think that's really important because so many issues today have become even more politicized than before. Right. And that can really sort of compound that inertia that you're talking yeah. about. But actually, where did that inspiration or that desire to make a difference come from? Because I think everyone listening to this podcast wouldn't have chosen to be here unless they feel some instinct to do the same. Where did it start with you? So my parents were both professors. My dad was a professor of what was then the Soviet Union or, or now Russia. And my mother was a professor of Chinese history. And so the dinner table conversation was, it wasn't about the Red Sox or about the weather. It was about the world and, and our place in it. And, and I always felt that it was, you know, both my duty and my ambition to, to, you know, address issues I care about. We're not spectators on this planet. We're participants. And so, you know, that to me, that, that's what I, when I use the word activist, that means I act on the issues I care about. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. My dad was a lawyer. And I think just the conversations you have year over year have as to how you codify values and, and coexist inform the decisions I made. I think that that's very, very true. And sometimes we don't realize what an effect that's having on us. 
But why a tea company? So you, <laughs> you and your, you know, professor at Yale, Barry Nelber, you know, came together and, and how did you approach him in the first place and why tea? Yeah. So in 1995, it was at the Yale School of Management and I was Barry's student in a competitive strategy course. And one of the case studies we looked at was the Cola Wars and, and this dynamic where Coke and Pepsi were duking it out over carbonated soda. And, and uh, Barry said, well, is there any, any other way for these these two to compete. And, and of course, yes, they don't just have to try to sell, you know, a Coke versus Pepsi. They could totally change the, the dynamic by offering uh, drinks with different sweetness levels or different sourcing practices. And uh, we basically left that idea in the classroom. We, we were, you know, we, we agreed, we were aligned, but I had to find a job. I was in my second year of business school. So I moved down to Bethesda, Maryland, and I started working in what would now be called ESG investing. And uh, after a presentation I gave in New York City uh, on behalf of the, the fund I worked with, I went for a run. And after the run, I was thirsty. And I went to the cooler and I, I said, there's nothing here. There's all these same, you know, I thought back to Barry's class. It's all these sweet drinks, all these water drinks, nothing in the middle. So I reached back out to Barry and I said, I, I am ready to, to act on this now, that, that idea we brought up. And Barry had just come back from India where he had been studying the tea industry and he had come up with the name Honest Tea. And then for me, it kind of like the clouds part. Well, that's a right. perfect name. And it gives us this license to really have a, uh, to do more than just sell liquid in a bottle, but to really put an ethos behind it and a whole approach to it. So I left my job in the investment world and started brewing tea in my kitchen. And, and uh, <laughs> I managed to get an appointment with the local Whole Foods buying office where I presented five thermoses of tea and an empty Snapple bottle that um, we pasted, you know, some labels on. And that was enough for the buyer to say he was willing to give us a try. And he placed an order for 15,000 bottles. That's amazing. And I think what I'd love people to take away is that this seemingly innocuous moment when you just went for a run yes. and it wasn't, that transformed your life. And also you didn't let somebody say no for you. You reached back out to the professor and yes. said, hey, what about standing up that idea? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs have great ideas, but they, they don't take that leap. Would, would you say that's fair? That's right. It's both the idea and the partnership, right? So, so the idea, sort of some dots connected, but you know, Barry and I had always had a great um, communication and real respect for each other. And I think part of it may have been, as I said, my, my parents were professors. So I often was able to speak uh, more frankly with my professors than a lot of my classmates. Sure. It could, could be a, very intimidating for some of the students. And, and so, um, but I, I think there's, so there's two, two kind of circle backs. One was the idea, but also the person with whom I had that connection. And so, you know, the two of those converged uh, when we got together and, and we're still, you know, wonderfully close friends and, and collaborators. And, you know, to what degree did you formalize, integrate purpose and values at that point? Because now it oh, seems so yeah. self-evident, but that was yeah. a long time ago. So, you know, it's so fun. So uh, on Honesty's website, which is, you know, it's still there is our original business plan. And you can just go you know, to honesty.com and find it there. And in that very first business plan, we outline it's called an aspiration for social responsibility because, of course, the company wasn't yet formed. So we, we just talked about what we aspire to do. But what's so uh, gratifying about that statement is that if you read it, it actually describes the brand almost exactly the way it is today, talking about a commitment to authentic and, and sustainably sourced ingredients, talking about a commitment to helping support economically uh, disadvantaged communities. And in the case of Honesty, it manifests itself through fair trade sourcing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we, in, we, we called it in mission in a bottle. We brewed it into the, the drink we made. And we also created guardrails around it such that even after Honesty got acquired by Coca-Cola, those values are still very much intact. So how do you navigate that? Because you see Ben and Jerry's, you see seventh generation in the Unilever family, you see lots of examples like this. How do you either protect the integrity yeah. of your brand or how do you upload it to the mothership? You leave as little to chance as you can. And what I mean by that is with Honest Tea, everything was certified organic and, and it wasn't just, oh, take our word for it, it's all natural. No, the, there's a USDA organic seal that is uh, federally enforced, in fact, even internationally enforced, so that someone is inspecting the tea gardens, whether they're in India or China. And then with fair trade sourcing, again, we don't just say, oh, we're socially responsible. We give back to our supplier communities. 
Fair Trade has a, a very rigorous inspection mechanism and auditing mechanism to make sure that not just that the working conditions are there, but that there's um, money going back to these communities that's audited to make sure that the community has a say in how the money's invested. And of course, the third pillar of honesty was the nutrition and that the consumer can just see, you know, by having seen the lower calorie label. And then how do you, in those final negotiations, because you've effectively got this Trojan horse where you bring these values into a yeah. wider portfolio and so on, how do you uh, identify the right partner? And then what role do you play over time together? Well, the best uh, way to, to enforce it and make sure they were upheld was just to grow the brand. You know, there was no, there was nothing legal we could say that it has to always be organic or anything like that. But what we did was worked hard. And I, I you know, um, Honesty first took an investment from Coca-Cola in 2008. They bought the company in 2011, but I stayed on through 2019. Um, and that was for me the best way to ensure uh, that the brand came to its, you know, scale and to fruition with all those equities embedded in there. And, and as I said, they are still there today. So I feel, I feel very good about um, the way the brand has, you know, sort of been adopted, uh, but also been embraced. You know, and, and uh, for those who've never been to it, there's a big event called Expo West where new food brands and beverage brands are on display. And one of the things I love about Seth, I've got to tell everyone, is that I was there at this year's, you know, they stood up a, a live event for the first time. And there was Seth, front of the booth, out there, eat the change, down in the trenches again. So in the spirit of being in the trenches, uh, from that honesty experience, yeah. what glorious mistakes did you make? What would you do? What different? <laughs> how, how many days do you? <laughs> <laughs> what would you do oh, differently? Well, look, it's all a journey, and you know you don't regret your scars or the gray. I probably have fewer gray hairs, but <laughs> the biggest mistake we made was that um, for six years we owned a portion of a bottling plant because we thought that was essential in order for us to be able to make our product, and it was only after we we're able to pass off the bottling plan. I don't want to say we sold it because it was a, it was a liability, but we were able to <laughs> bestow it upon <laughs> someone else that it freed me up to really build the brand with full scale. And, and so it wasn't just the business distraction. It was the personal energy. The plant was in Pittsburgh. I was in Bethesda, Maryland. I would try to, every few weeks I'd go do these just brutal drives and get up at like three in the morning and get to Pittsburgh by, you know, seven thirty stay until about 3.30, you know, drive home, sometimes have to pull over to take a nap. And I just, bet you, you you were great company at home after a day oh, like that, right? It was just, it was, just a, it was the wrong use of my energy. Uh, right. It wasn't where my passion was. And and so part of what I learned was, one, make sure that the most, you know, you've got it, you, that people always say your time is your most valuable asset. My, ener my energy is my most yeah. valuable yeah. asset. So make sure you've got the right energy and you, you kind of do what you can to cultivate it and protect it. Um, also really make sure that the work you're doing is what you love uh, and what you're good at. And frankly, I, I wasn't great at uh, running a bottling plant. Um, it just wasn't, wasn't needed. Uh, so make, the, the, the real lesson is make sure you're building what's valuable. And of course, Coca-Cola would never have looked at that bottling plant as an asset because they, they can make products so much better at such larger scale. And so, um, as I said, once we got past the bottling plant, all of a sudden we realize, well, we're here to build this honest brand. And, and that can be so much more than just producing tea. It can actually produce a product like Honest Kids, which was our kids line. And that's, you know, taken off. Uh, and so um, that was a good, good, good lesson. And uh, it was an expensive lesson. <laughs> yeah, I think that the, 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 the more they cost, the quicker you learn them. But um, <laughs> also, I want to call out something you mentioned there, which is so important and meant a lot to me, too. I found in the early years of entrepreneurship, you're always sort of dialing up your energy and throwing your energy at everything. Mm -hmm. But if you do that long enough and you get exhausted long enough, you realize that your focus should be in when can you dial down your energy? When you, mm -hmm. can you preserve and protect yeah. your energy? Because yeah. the job takes so much out of you. Would you say that's fair? I think that's fair. I also think for me, I'm most focused on how do I infuse my energy into others? How do I get people as excited about their business as I am? And, and that means spending time with them, um, you know, making sure they're focused on the right work, uh, making sure that we are passing on the right message, whether it's to a, a, a grocery store or to a consumer or to a, uh, the media, you know, making sure that um, the vision and, the, and it, it becomes a, a real palpable thing within this company. And, and so a lot of my energy is, is focused on spreading it as well. 
Yeah, that sort of passion and energy is contagious. Um, and then in 2013, you went into the meat analog, the, the sort of beyond meat. You, you joined the board there. How did you transition? Because that's kind of a little bit of a sort of 180, shall we say? Yeah. So I, my family has been vegetarian for, oh, uh, I don't know, 18 years now. Uh, but back in 2013, so we sold Honesty in 2011, and I was enjoying the work, but I was getting that entrepreneurial niche. I wanted to go build and create. You know, what we were doing at Honesty was scaling, and that's important work, but it wasn't creating as much. And so uh, I was just kind of thinking about what would the right idea be. And my wife happened to read this article about this company getting started out in California that was seeking to replicate the never gonna detection. Never going to take off, right? Never going to well, go no, anywhere. No, her, her response was, well... As, as a family of vegetarians that really misses eating our burgers, this could be a good idea. Let's, right. She said, you should reach out to those, those folks and see if you can help. And so I literally sent an email to info at beyondmeat.com. <laughs> and I said, I read about what you're doing. I, I've learned a lot. Um, if there's any way I can help, you know, please let me know. And, and they emailed back pretty promptly <laughs> saying, we need some help. <laughs> and... And what was interesting about the company is that it had just gotten some good financing in place, but no one on the board had a food background. They were all finance and tech people. And so uh, my experience was very relevant for, for the business. And so I got into uh, first a weekly cadence of talking to the CEO, Ethan Brown. And then we thought, boy, this is useful. Let's talk every other day. And, uh, and then you know, I had joined the board by that time. And so... I created this very unusual arrangement where I was able to work half time with Beyond Meat and become executive chair of the board, and then the other half of the time work for Honest Tea and still help be that sort of founder presence and you know guiding vision. Um, and I, it was a wonderful you know five years that we we grew, grew both brands and sometimes I would travel internationally and got to work with both brands and you know the same time. Uh, and of course with Beyond Meat, it, it it built from less than a million dollars in sales to eventually going public and. You know, um, today the business is over 500 million in sales and, and you know, I'm, I'm chair of the board now. And, you know, it's easy to think that this was an easy road to you back then. But I can imagine in these dorm, these, these sort of nascent days, what was it like? You know, what were the challenges that you faced yeah, when you came in the door? I love, all, you know, for me, of course, there are real challenges, but I love all of, you know, the first challenge is can you sell the product? And then if you're lucky enough to be able to sell it, uh, you know, can you make it? <laughs> but you have to, there's a challenge about convincing consumers. Why is this, you know, why is it different and why is it something you want, right? So, of course, with Honest Tea, why would you want a less sweet tea? And people aren't used to that. And with Beyond Meat, plant-based meat, they didn't understand. They don't like veggie burgers. So anything that smacks of that is, is not appealing. And so it really was kind of reintroducing them or giving them, getting them to give veggie burgers or plant-based burgers a second try. Uh, and then scaling globally, thinking about the supply chain and where are we going to be able to grow enough of the ingredients? And then, you know, going internationally to sales, how do we convince uh, people in other markets? And what that what is that challenge like? So I uh, they're inevitably challenging, frustrating. There's moments where you lose sleep. Uh, and of course, I don't I don't relish those. But, I, you know, and I've been losing sleep now with the new startup, Eat the Change. But it's all part of the journey. And I just love that feeling of building and, 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 you know, even the, the, the successes or the wins can be really small when you start, you know, when you start from scratch, but they are, they are wins. And it's, it's just that feeling of building and creating that's, and of course the impact, uh, because with every win, whether it's winning a new consumer, winning a new chain, winning a new restaurant, um, you know, the impact of what you're doing and, and on all the businesses, whether it's honesty, beyond me to reap the change, when you embed your mission in your product, then you know that every win is, is, has an impact to it. Yeah, that is a, a tangible, ongoing reward. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got as an entrepreneur is develop a healthy relationship with anxiety because you either have too much going on or not enough going on yeah. and there's very few moments in between. Yeah. I just want to push in before we go to eat the change, the education piece must have been huge, much like the shared economy with Uber yes. or Airbnb. Yeah. How did you solve for educating people even to adopt or try? Yeah. Well, this is all, I think with all these businesses, it's, they're really part of a movement to shift people's dietary habits. And so like any movement, uh, whether it's a political campaign or a nonprofit, um, you have to educate people and, and ideally you can get them inspired. But sometimes you just have to rely on taste. This is one thing I've always said, doesn't matter. Whatever you're selling, it's got to taste great because... 
you may get someone to join you because they're a believer, but um, they're only going to stick with you if the, if the taste delivers as well. Uh, right. And so what's striking about whether, you know, it was with Honest Tea and Organic and Fair Trade, Beyond Meat with Plant-Based Protein, we started, when I got involved with all these things, they were totally nascent. These, these were barely on the, the, you know, the level of awareness was so low with, with the consumer. And it, it's the same with Eat the Change now. And uh, but, but when you start from, from almost nothing, then every, every sort of advancement is, is something. It is and something. So, and you've got nothing to lose, right? I mean, yeah. And then you look at, look at what's happened. Uh, talk about plant-based protein. So, you know, from 2013, when the Beyond Burger didn't exist, to today, where every continent in the country has it, and not just Beyond Meat, but plant-based protein more broadly, um, it's incredibly gratifying to see that impact. And, of course, it's still so early. It's so you early. Know, yeah, but you know where we're where we're going, and 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 you you, you can feel that uh, what the future looks like, and understand how you're a part of it. I mean, what percentage over the, of the overall protein market yeah. are these plant based alternatives? Super it's still small. very very small. Yeah, so it's just about one percent. Now it's a huge market. So, um, but what's interesting and where we take inspiration is you look at plant based dairy, which is about sixteen percent of the dairy market, uh, and of course twenty years ago. Um, soy milk was, of course it existed, but it was not really marketed in, in the, it was marketed in a shelf stable box. And then when they moved to the, the, the dairy case, that's when things happened. And of course with Beyond Meat being the first plant-based burger to be merchandised in the meat section of the store, as opposed to the freezer, that's where we see this big expansion. And now you're seeing, uh, uh companies like Beyond Meat partnering with major, uh, quick serve restaurant chains around, around the globe. And this and, is how you start to penetrate in a much broader way. And just you know, to get the benefit of your expertise, on several occasions, you've got in very early to markets that then exploded. Are there any common denominators or is it instinct when you um, get? Well, certainly one of them for me is this idea that it's, it's a fundamentally different product, right? So I'll take the example of Honest Kids. We, this is our, our kids drink. And um, we brought it out. We looked at the kids drink case. And I actually, the way this one came to light is kind of a funny story. My, I have three sons. My, my middle son asked me one morning as I was making, putting things in their lunchbox, he said, dad, how come you're selling these healthy drinks to grownups, but you're putting these really sugary drink pouches in my lunchbox? And I looked and I realized the drink pouch I was putting in his lunchbox had a hundred calories per pouch, which was more calories per ounce than in a can of soda. And this is what I was putting in my son's lunchbox. Wow. And so the answer would not have been to say, all right, well, if everyone's at 100 calories, let's go make an 80-calorie drink. That, that's not the right answer. Instead, we said, let's go make a 40-calorie drink. You know, and, and why 40 calories? It was just sweet enough that kids like my son would be happy with it. But um, for me, it was 60% fewer calories, so dramatically right. different. Um, so so the, the way that we've been able to make inroads – is by offering something that's fundamentally different from what's out there. And, and you know, sometimes with, with uh, plant-based protein, someone would say, well, the best idea would be to mix, do a 50% animal burger and a 50% plant-based patty, but that's kind of a, a neither. It's, it's neither, you know, plant-based and it's neither animal-based. So uh, the, the answer is to make a plant-based that tastes as good as you can make it. Uh, and so what we're doing, one of the really fun things we've just done at Eat the Change, this, this new company, is we, we looked at the kids snack case and I said, I want to make a, a snack that is the analog. So if honest kids is to the, you know, kids drink net par- mar- pouch market, I want to make a snack that is equally compelling and equally different. And so of course, one thing category we looked at was what are called fruit juice. They're anywhere from 80 to hundred calories. Turns out there's not really fruit in them at all. There's some, maybe some fruit pectin or some fruit juice. Um, and so the answer wouldn't have been to say, all right, well, let's make a 60 calorie fruit snack. Instead, we said, let's make a kid snack that actually is based on a real food. And so we launched this new product that's called um, Cosmic Carrot Chews, and it's made with carrots. <laughs> and, and, and when you look in the pouch, the product is a carrot. Uh, and so the first ingredient is carrot. And it has all the nutritional benefits and all the fiber and the vitamin A of a carrot. Now, um, of course, we have to get the kid to be willing to adopt it, but we know the parent will get will quickly understand why this is just a much better product. So, you know, a lot of our food systems scale the way it scaled because companies looked for relatively inexpensive and high margin 
I'll say cheap <laughs> ways to offer um, things. And, and now we have the chance to help reset. We have the chance to, you know, we have to communicate to parents and bring them products that in this case are fairly easy to understand. And, you know, there seems to be these little signature moments that triggered these new companies as you're sharing. What was it that led you from, from for example, Plant Burger to Eat the Change? Yeah. So this was a fun one. Uh, and and I, as you'll notice, a theme, right? So I talked, about my, I talked about my wife inspiring me to go after Beyond Meat, my son inspiring me to, to launch uh, Honest Kids. My oldest son was the head of marketing for Plant Burger. And he came up with this phrase, eat the change you wish to see in the world. And as soon as you said it, I just thought, wow, that's, that's what a great call to action. Because, and of course, you know, it's a phrase that's attributed to Gandhi and who said, if you, the way you act is, is how you can make change in the world. And it's no, it's even more so with food, uh, that your every day, our biggest daily environmental impact is what we eat. You know, it's great if you can bike to work or recycle or, or use less plastic, but what you put in this, uh, in your body <laughs> is by far the single biggest driver of your environmental footprint. And so uh, I realized that phrase, eat the change, would be a great name for a brand because it's a, it's a call to action, it's a call to empowerment, and a call to accountability. And so if we could help people make that connection and do it with products that exemplify that, that consciousness. And so I mentioned this carrot snack. Well, it turns out that carrots are one of the most water-efficient crops in the world. They take about 20 gallons of water to make a pound of carrots. I contrast that with about 1,800 gallons of water to make a pound of almonds, or, or of course, to meat is almost the same as almonds in terms of the water footprint. And then the way we design the cosmic carrot juice, we use the full carrot, there's no food waste. Um, so, uh, you know, we actually had initially looked at trying to make a carrot chip, like a potato chip that we made with carrots, but there was gonna be so much waste with the carrot, like let's not, you know, we're trying to create an example. Uh, and then, of course, everything is organic, and um, we in, in embed as much of that um, climate consciousness as we can into the products we design. The other product line that we have is a mushroom jerky, and once again, mushrooms are extremely water efficient. Ext they grow on compost, so once again, a great example of how to um, help people shift their diets to more climate-friendly food, planet-friendly food. And I want to call out something which I think is so important because you're launching these businesses and building them, but you're also scaling brands. And if yeah. you look at the narratives across the companies that we're talking about that you've led, you know, you've got, um, you've got initially uh, Honest Tea, which is honest about what's in it and what it does for you. You've got right. Beyond Meat, which is taking the narrative of meat further. You've got Plant Burger, which is distinguishing something familiar. And now you've got Eat the Change. And I want to ask you, Eat the change is a very direct call to action, as you say. And would you say, would you agree that there's a big shift in marketing now that brands are showing up as platforms that enable shifts in consumer behavior? We hope so. <laughs> we, you know, that's certainly um, everything about the way we communicate, and, you know, does embrace the messaging. But at the same time, you know, as I said, the carrots, we may be able to sell them to a parent once because of our climate agenda. We're not going to sell them again if the child doesn't come home and say, oh, you know, mom or dad, I, I liked what I had in my lunchbox today. You know, I'll, I'll eat more of that. Um, and so it has to work on its own. It, it, you know, um, certainly from my perspective, what gets me motivated and excited and a lot of my team is the mission. But part of that mission is we also have to make a brand that's fun and accessible and, and tasty. And, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I actually got to know you was I, I, I noticed this incredible calendar that you put out there, which was all about consumer change. I saw to explain to those listening, it's a calendar that over a period of 28 days, rather than tell you to change wholesale what you're doing in your eating habits and so on, it gave you small little steps that allowed you to incrementally sort of upgrade your, the, 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 tell us why you took that approach, yeah. why it was successful. We want to... Um... I think sometimes people get overwhelmed. You know, it's, this is a crazy world we're living in. There's so much going on. And sometimes you just feel like I can't change all of it. I can't do anything about all of it. But you can do something. And the easiest thing you can control, and this is totally within your jurisdiction, is what you choose to eat every day. And so every day, yes, for our incredible planet challenge, we offer just a different little uh, suggestion. And, and we try to make them as accessible as possible. For the day one, it's just swap out dairy. So if you're going to have coffee or cereal, 
um, just put a plant-based substitute in. It's such a simple kind of lateral move. It doesn't take a lot. And that's all you need to do on day one. And then, you know, we go on and there's other examples of obviously you can make a taco, uh, you know, night with that. You go out and eat at a restaurant and order something plant-based. You can um, make a dinner with leftovers. You can try incorporating new ingredients into your, you know, what you make at home. But all of these things are steps towards a more planet-friendly diet. And, and we just want to make them accessible. We make them fun. We have different chefs who we've engaged with, different brands, different giveaways, all in the name of just helping a, awaken some interest. And, and I, like I said, even with Beyond Meat, we always made a point, and we still make a point, we don't want to be judgmental. We're not saying anybody who eats animals is bad. That's not, that's not a way to sell something. We want to help us inspire people to try something new uh, and, and, you know, understand why we think it's worth doing. And, you know, just to build on that, I think one of the most powerful things you can do in marketing today is shift from this idea of one-to-one -one, where you're selling to one yeah. consumer to one-to-one -to, -one to many to get yes. that customer to advocate or evangelize on your behalf. So you create these experiences, but then how do you get people to talk about what you're doing? Yeah, well, and social media is so powerful here, right? Where we can, you know, um, share this campaign. And I, leading up to the launch of the Incredible Planet Challenge, I spoke to, every, you know, businesses, schools, colleges, anybody who would listen about what we're doing and and what just to show how easy it is to do. Uh, and 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 then part of what we do through social media is encourage them to share it with others. And so for the giveaways, when we do that. Um, they're eligible for a giveaway when they share and pass the word on to some more friends. And so we just want to spread this as widely as we can. And of course, the other thing we do is we leverage all the other brands who participate and get them to tell their community. So, you know, we worked with a plant-based dairy company um, on day one at their partner. They may not have as much interest in, in someone using reusable uh, bottles. Uh, that's not in their charter, but those people who have been engaged with them get the message too. So we, we are able to expand using the network. We can expand much broader, much more um, further than our own platform. And, you know, one of the great sort of needs in the food space is underserved communities. I mean, you've got yes. infrastructure and healthcare and education and so many other issues that play into results like food deserts or just, you know, the proliferation of, you know, fast food restaurants, which have so many health you know, effects. Yes. How does a company like yours, Eat the Change, play into that? Mm -hmm. It's really an important question. And, and one of our commitments within our um, planet-based commitments is access for all. And so um, we actually stood up a grants program before we even launched the business. And this was from a separate pot of money, but my wife and I did it in the name of Eat the Change because we wanted to really, um, it was our own way to discover what were the causes, how do we sort of manifest this mission and we found amazing nonprofits all over the United States that we could uh, donate to that were helping to democratize plant-based diets and doing it through education, through access, whether setting up a store, setting up a farmer's market, working in the classroom to help kids grow plants and understand what they are and they, they don't grow on, you know, they don't just pop appear on a shelf uh, and how to integrate them into our diet. And so this is now our third year with this grants program. And just really been um, inspiring to see the kind of leaders we've been able to support and help advance this cause. And I mean, it's not unique to eat the change or, you know, plant-based meat, but these issues become so readily politicized these days, yeah. especially in these echo chambers of social media. How do you navigate, not just speaking to either those who yeah. are converted or those who are open to it, but those who are really resistant for a lot of reasons? Yeah, for us, once again, we have to lead with taste. So we're never going to try to put our agenda in front of somebody and say, this is why you need to change your diet. We want to talk about how delicious this is, how, you know, with the kids product, we just made it fun. We just wanted it to be something that a kid and a parent could, you know, think is a fun, accessible, because we've got to, we're not competing, you know, we're basically competing with gummy bears. <laughs> so right, right. We can't just show a picture of a carrot and say, eat your carrots. It's got to right. be, you know, cosmic carrot chews and and get ready for liftoff. Uh, we have to we have to find ways to engage people. That's fun, and it has to be about taste. Anybody who wants to dig in on our website, either eatthechange.com or eatthechange.org, can go many layers down and, and discover the the depth of our commitment and our sourcing practices and the and the farmers that we work with. Um, but you know, at, at the same time, that the job that people hire us to do, I always say this to my team: they hire us to you know provide them with nutrition. 
uh, or calories. And we've got to do that first. And so that's why our messaging has to emphasize those things. And and despite the sort of 1% market share of, you know, plant-based alternatives, you know, there's so much sort of upside ahead. You do see large companies like, you know, know, the Meatless Farm, you know, you see Kellogg's, you see Kroger going into this area. Is that, is that good for the market? Yeah. No, we've got to grow this category. And so we need more participants and um, it, it is how you build something. It's, you know, it, what's striking and, and perhaps the most powerful indicator when we launched Honest Kids, um, as I said, we went into a market where everything was 100 calories. If you go to a shelf today, you'll see far more varieties and, you know, certainly some 40 calorie, but a lot more 60 calorie. And so, you know, there's a great phrase that um, the, the CEO of Patagonia once told me. She said, you want to make it uh, uncomfortable for your competitors not to follow you. Right. You know? And, and so that's, that's, all, that's part of what we, we want to do. And, and you build a category by basically legitimizing it. And so when we went to the grocery store and put Beyond Meat in the meat case as the first plant-based protein, we knew we wouldn't be the only one there. It becomes a section of a store when there's more brands. And so, yes, we'll, we'll build that out as a, as, a, as a movement. And then as a mindset, how do you approach growing the category and collaborating with otherwise competitors and also delivering on your own mandate, which is to grow your own business. Yeah, well, you have to keep in mind what's the competition. It's certainly our, the goal, you know, we would never want the goal of winning all 1% of the meat market. We would rather see it expand to 16% and being the largest player in that category. That's a win. Just, you know, sort of duking it out with the other brands is not it's not a worthwhile investment of our time or our impact. Uh, so you've got to think expansively about changing the paradigm. And that's certainly for all the businesses I've been in. That's that's what we're about. And, you know, obviously there's urgencies around these areas because there's a need outright to feed people, to look after their health and so on. But there's a larger context around the IPCC reports and updates that are coming yes. out saying, you know, we're working against timelines in terms of the climate emergency, loss of yeah. biodiversity and so on, that are very, they're contracting towards us. And so where are we in the plant-based food movement? Because you've had the luxury of all, yeah. building all these different businesses. How well are we doing? How far are we getting? What's the urgency? Well, it's so early. The urgency is tremendously high because it's all, I, I, I don't want to sound doomsday, but it's too late. We, the earth is changing. We have, this is our doing. And, and so, you know, global warming isn't something we have to worry about as a future thing. It's happening now. And it, and it is due to so much of, of our own impact. Um, and so the good news is we do know without dispute that plant-based protein is a more sustainable option. You know, when we, and, and we've had a independent life cycle analysis done uh, for Beyond Meat when it uses 99% less water, 93% less land, creates 90% fewer greenhouse gases to make uh, some uh, compared to a beef burger. So we know this is a solution. The other thing, of course, we know is, is if we scale the American diet as is and feed it, try to feed it to the rest of the world, we will need two and a half Earths to do that. Well, last time I checked, we didn't have that many Earths. Right, right. <laughs> and so, you know, we can, we know that we can feed the planet uh, nutritious and sustainable food. There is a diet that can do it. It's just not the diet that we have in the United States. And so we have to make these shifts and, and it has to happen urgently. Um, and uh, so, so that's the doomsday scenario and that can be upsetting. The other way to look at it is this whole category didn't exist six years ago. Right. And look at the change that's happened. And so I never get... Of course, I pay attention to quarterly results, but I look at what's happened in just the past few years, and I, I, it makes me incredibly excited about the future. Uh, and so while um, it can be depressing at times, it just depends what indicators you look at. And I, I always say um, when I'm thinking about strategy or where we want to go, I never, you know, a, a, a sailor doesn't uh, sail by other ships. It sails by the stars. So you need to sort of think about what direction you want to head. Don't worry about what others are doing. Stay focused on that destination. Right. I think that's great advice. And and also, I mean, given the urgency, given the progress that's being made, what do you see the future of food looking like here in the U.S. or around the world? If you could cast your eye 10 years down the track. Yeah, I do think this shift will be inevitable because here's what's happening right now. When you ask people about their diet and the climate, they'll say, well, I understand that when the climate changes, I won't necessarily be able to eat the same kind of foods I used to eat. But they haven't yet made the flip, which is, I understand that the dietary choices I make will have an impact on the climate. They're not there yet. Uh, 
And so we need to keep working on that message and we need to bring that to life. And, and so sometimes, you know, when you, when you see or hear about incidents in the news, it helps bring it to life, but sometimes it takes the marketing that we're doing. And, and, and so I do think whether it's Beyond Meat or Eat the Change, this ethos will much become much more of a mindset for people. Uh, so you've heard about, you've heard about obviously, um, carnivores, herbivores, vegetarians, and there's also a, a wave of people called climatarians who choose foods based on climate. You've certainly heard people talk about choosing local foods or choosing foods in season, but there'll be a lot more nuance to the dietary choices people make. And so part of that will rely on information. Uh, so people will become much more aware of the foods they eat and their environmental impact. And, and, um, it, you know, it, it is, it take, it does take education for sure, but I do see that being very much part of the, the future. And I think restaurants as well will start to make choices that are more informed, better informed, whether it's because of seasonality or, or of sourcing and, and, uh, because they want to talk about whether it's fine foods or high quality foods, they'll want to be able to, um, demonstrate they've evaluated the ethical considerations as well. And as someone who has a unique line of sight, over all your experience, but also the industry and the food system, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> well, sometimes it's just worrying about how, how come my mushrooms didn't arrive at the smokehouse <laughs> on time and all of the, um, I don't want to call them true, the, the, the day-to-day worries, those keep me awake. I, I, I don't worry about um, the business impact because I know I'm doing everything I can. And so... Um, of course, the world is that you can you can sort of you know be upset that uh, you know the, about the darkness, or you can light a candle. And so for me, I'm lighting a candle, and that's I'm doing what I can do uh, in, in as many ways as I can, uh, as powerfully as I can, with as, and bringing as many people to it as I can. So that doesn't keep me awake. Uh, <laughs> the other thing, my, my our three sons are growing up and going into the world, and. We still, you know, want worry and you know want the best for them and 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 for the other people in our lives. But um, you know that's all part of life and, and the journey. So I, I I I generally I find that the more I exercise, the better I sleep, and that's, that's right. The more de- <laughs> that's, yeah. a, that's a bigger determinant of my quality of sleep. Right. That the more tired you are mentally from work and physically from yeah. from running. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of co- reasons to be optimistic and you've touched on some of them. But is there anything of all the reasons out there that you'd point to that the listeners could go, actually, that's right. I want, you know, that is a re- something yeah. to hang our hat on. What would you point to? Well, I, I think when consumers understand uh, the impact of their diets, they make choices. And so it's, it's, not, it's not like we have to unlock some crazy secret code. The, the code is, is there. It's just about information for people and helping people connect the dots. And, and, you know, even in my family, so as I said, we're, we're all vegans now, but 16 years ago, uh, we weren't. Right. And so we just went through a process of, you know, learning and talking and thinking and discussing, and uh, we changed. And I, my wife never would have imagined being vegan. She came, as she says, she came from a long line of carnivores, and, and <laughs> which, of course, we all did. And, and um it's just being able to frame things in a different light. And of course, then finding that there's actually not sacrifice involved with making these choices. There can be both a delight and almost a freedom to it that um, we hadn't expected. Well, Seth, I can't thank you enough for being, you know, such a committed activist through all of this journey and such an accomplished entrepreneur because you've enabled the market to get the traction it has and there's more to come from here. So thank you for your insights today. That's great to be with you, Simon. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Lead with We. And you can find out more information about today's guest, Seth Goldman, in the show notes of this episode. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts so you never miss an episode. Plus, you can now find us on all United Airlines in-flight entertainment consoles as well. And if you like this video, hit the like button below and be sure to subscribe. Finally, if you want to dive even deeper into the world of purposeful business, Check out my new book and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Lead With We, which is now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Google Books. Lead With We is produced by Goal17 Media. I'll see you again soon, and until then, let's all lead with we.